Paul and his team write a letter. And this is what it says. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. There are three areas of transformation that we are going to look at this morning. The first is turning away from idols. The second is service. And the third is eternity. And these are all found in the, in the last part of that passage. Turning away from idols, serving, and eternity. Let's start with turning to God from idols. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. When they heard the gospel, the Thessalonians turned to God from idols. Idols refer to the objects of their worship. They, they didn't know it, but the, the objects that they were worshiping were not worthy of their worship because they were not living and true. Paul says you turned to the living and true God. John Gill's exposition of the Bible puts it this way. For the Thessalonians, before the gospel came among them, were idolaters, here, the Decabri, the great and chief gods of the Gentiles, were worshipped as Jupiter and Bacchus, Ceres, Proserpina, Pluto and Mercury, Castor and Pollux, and Esculapius. These, the Macedonians, and particularly the Thessalonians, worshipped with great devotion and reverence. But now they turned from them and forsook them. And these gods mentioned here covered different areas. There, were, there was a god of the sky and thunder, a god of agriculture, a god of fertility, a god of war, a god of the underworld, uh, a god of financial gain. There were different gods that they were turning away from. But only God, dear friends, as revealed through the Bible, is the living and true God. He is the only genuine God. Other gods are false gods. And the most significant false god, who is also living, 
is the devil, who Paul calls when he writes to the Corinthians, the God of this age. For the Thessalonians to turn to the true and living God means that they put themselves under his authority. It means they believed the gospel. They believed that they were sinful, that they needed a savior, that they needed to repent and turn away from their wicked ways and and put their trust in Jesus Christ. It meant to say no to the way of life that they had followed under the idols and to pursue the life that God wanted them to pursue. You know, people still worship idols today. We still have idols even in our lives today. And it might not be a statue or an image that you have in your house. It might be, but not necessarily. Some of the things that we worship today, and when we talk about idols, we are talking about things that we make more important than God. Here's God, this is more important. That's essentially what an idol is. And you don't need an image, a physical image to do that. You need a heart, which is deceitful above all things, as the Bible says. Ezekiel speaks about how idols are set up in the heart. So what are some of the things that we can set up in our hearts as idols? Career, money, success, status, fame, comfort, sex, Pornography, these are things that can become idols in our lives. Things that can become more important than God. And not all idols are necessarily bad things. In fact, many things that we make idols are good things. Family can be an idol. Parents can be an idol. I think we have a, we have a Swahili saying, um, something along the lines of, Mama ni mungu apili. Is that correct? Something like that. That, you know, your, your mom is actually like your second God. Wow. We're called to honor our parents, but we're not called to make them a God. So, the things that we make idols are not necessarily bad things. They can be good things that become ultimate things. And then, instead of God being there, the idol is there and God is somewhere there. We can even become idols to ourselves. It's like, I am the God of my life. I rule and reign here. No one tells me what to do. This is the era where self has gone to new levels. So friends, as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, we need to continually be turning away from idols. We are still being made into more godly followers of Christ. We haven't arrived. And as we are on that journey, we draw along others and say, hey, I I want you to be on this journey as well. I want to help you also become a more devoted follower of Christ. 
And as we share life, as we have conversations, as we build community, we get to know, ah, so that's your struggle. That's your issue. Let's talk about that. And we encourage each other. We help each other. We disciple each other along the way. But then it also needs to go out to those who aren't even followers of Christ yet. Like, go out there and share that with your friends, your family, your community who aren't following Christ and help them to turn away from idols to serve this true and living God. When individuals like you and I and communities turn from idols, the impact is huge. As we do it at our individual level, it's like salt, it's like yeast, and it just goes and it, you, you put it there, you put it there, and it transforms, it changes things. We can be agents of transformation in our city, helping people to turn away from idols to serve God, to follow the one true God. The second area of transformation is this area of serving. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You turned to God and he is the living and true God. And to to serve means to be fully devoted to him as a slave is devoted to their master. In those days, households had slaves. Now, it's not the brutal slavery of more recent history, but it was slavery nonetheless, where a servant, which is what this idea of serving carries, that you're like a slave, you're completely submitted, you are completely under the authority of your master. That's, that's what it means to serve God. It's like, God, I am completely under your authority. I am fully submitted to you. The Thessalonians no longer served idols, they served God. They worshipped God. And for a disciple of Jesus Christ, every area of life is an opportunity to serve God. Family is an opportunity to serve God. Neighborhoods is an opportunity to serve God. Your place of study, your office, your business, your church. All these are opportunities to serve God. Serving God with our minds as well as with our bodies. If we take serving seriously, we can be part of transformation. At our men's prayer meeting yesterday, I, I had a conversation with, uh, with Kwesi. Kwesi, I hope you don't mind me referencing some of the things we spoke about, okay? And as we were talking, Kwesi was explaining how in, in his world of work, the corporate world, he's in banking, he was saying in the world of banking, actually, it's, it's about getting ahead. It's about putting yourself out there. And, and, and you know, kind of everybody else being put on the side. And he, says it's com- and he was saying it's completely different from the gospel. The gospel says we are to be servants. So Kwesi, as, as a banker, as a, as a man of influence in that world, he is there as a servant. His attitude is when he goes into the office in the morning, he's, he's going there to serve. And, and that's how it should be for all of us. Whatever we're going to be doing on Monday morning, I'm a servant. And if we go with that attitude, we are going there 
to transform. We're going there to be agents of change. A few weeks ago, some of us signed up to serve here in the church. Thank you so much. And this morning, there was some training that was happening uh, on the audio-visual stuff. Getting more people involved in serving in the church. There was a, a meeting that I saw as I was arriving of the welcome and hospitality team. As some new members were joining that team, they were in the banda there, discussing, getting ready, serving in the body. As a disciple of Christ, wherever you have an opportunity to serve, you have an opportunity to show a different way of life. You have an opportunity to make an impact, to be an agent of transformation. We're servants. And then the last thing is eternity. And this reality of eternity in this passage is captured by the reality that Jesus is coming back. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Waiting is about how the present relates to the future. If that is what's coming, how do I live today? And the message that the Thessalonians heard was a message that said, Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus ascended into heaven. And Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back, he's coming back with wrath, with judgment. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died on the cross to take your sins so that your sins are forgiven. Because this God who created everything demands justice for our sins. But because he's gracious, he chose to make a way. And that way was for his son to come into the world, live a perfect life, die for us, take our punishment, be our substitute so that we can be forgiven and then rise from the dead so that we can have new life. And this new life is, it's eternal. It's the gift of eternal life. The rescue that we see here, he rescues us from the coming wrath. This rescue, this redemption is, we are rescued from the punishment of being separated from God for all eternity. And we get the gift of being with him forever. How amazing is that? What kind of God is that? It's the God of the Bible. It's the God that they turned to. And, and hopefully the God that we have turned to. And if you haven't turned to that God, I, I hope you will turn to him. The Thessalonians understood this world is temporary. Jesus is coming back to judge it. And living with that perspective will transform the way we live. It will make us think through the lens of eternity. We should be asking the question, how is my life counting for eternity? How is the way I conduct my relationships, 
the way I use my talents, the way I use my resources, the way I live in every area of my life, how is that connected to eternity? When Jesus comes back to to judge the world, how many people will I have shared the message of the gospel with? Now, we don't want to make that a heavy, intense thing, like, okay, we've got to register. Jason, can I see how many people you've shared with today? I think some communities actually do that. It's like it's in my heart. I, I've embraced eternity. I've embraced eternal living. And, and part of that is helping others to, to get onto this path of following Christ. Thinking with an eternal mindset changes everything. Billy Graham said this, any philosophy which deals only with the here and now is not adequate for man. If, if your philosophy of life is all about the here and now, this world, you will be disappointed at the end of the day. We need to widen that philosophy to embrace something incredible, eternity, and the reality that Jesus Christ is coming back. I know for sure in my own life, I have room to to grow in, in thinking more about eternity and living more with an eternal mindset. I, I know that. I know that I spend probably too much time on things of this world. I'm sure of that. And, and perhaps that might be true of us as well. Now we... We do need to think about the things of this world, but we need to put them in perspective. If eternity is like the distance from that wall to that wall, this world is it's like a sliver over here somewhere. What would the wise woman do? What would the wise man do? Would they just focus on this sliver here Or would they be thinking about the breadth, the width of eternity? This will transform us. Transform us personally. Transform this community and it will overflow into Dar es Salaam and beyond. As we close, not just this message, but the series, I am excited about the idea of having a godly vision. Like God, use us to do something for your glory. Help us to surrender everything, every aspect of our lives for your glory. That, that's exciting. And I hope that through the weeks, we've been getting more challenged and perhaps heard some things that are uncomfortable. But man, I hope there's also been some things that are like, wow, wow. Is this what God is calling us to? Amazing. So brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us to ask the Lord to help us to go and make disciples, to be involved in planting churches. We had a Swahili service which we on hold. We're saying it's on hold because we hope to reintroduce it. 
Hopefully that'll happen soon. The, the plans are work in progress, and that could be one of the ways in which this church planting thing goes forward. Really believe, even as we've looked at the story from Philippi last week with households, that households in Sala Sala, perhaps that could be the way for us to take this idea of church planting forward. And then today, closing up with saying, God, change us. We don't want to be the same. We don't want to be idol worshipers. I don't want to be an idol worshiper. I don't want any of us to be idol worshipers. God, please, please help us to serve. Every area of life is an opportunity to serve, to humble ourselves and serve like our Lord Jesus Christ did. And then to embrace a perspective that is eternal. It's not just about the here and now. These bodies are wasting away. This present age will pass away. Living for eternity. And it's good to get it when you're still young. Most of our young people have left the room. Some of you might still be young people. But we can get it even when we're older if we haven't got it yet. Shall we stand? Lord, would you take us? Lord, would you change us? Make us into what you want us to be. Lord, would you take us? Lord, would you change us? Make us into what you want us to be. Lord, please transform us. Lord, please transform us. May we put aside idols and turn to serve you. Lord, please transform us. Help us to serve you, serve one another, serve this great city of Dar. Lord, may you help us embrace eternity. To see things through your eyes. This world is so temporary. Lord, would you take us? Lord, would you change us? Make us into what you want us to be. Lord, thank you for every man and woman here. Lord, we 
Thank you that you want to make us into something, that you love the church. You died for the church. You are coming back for the church. It is the church that will be around the throne of heaven for all eternity, worshiping you. But God, there are so many who are not yet in the church that we need to reach. So God, make us into all that you want us to be so that we can go out and reach them, so we can share the gospel, so we can share our testimony, so we can put aside the idols, the distractions of this world, the things that are holding our hearts, the things that we have made so important when actually they're, they're not supposed to be. Lord, thank you for good things. Help us not to make good things ultimate things. May everything find its rightful place. May we have the right perspective, God. Lord, may every person here know that they are loved, that you have a purpose and a plan for us, God. And Lord, we pray that we will not leave here the same, that we will not go out there and live the same as we have been living, but there will be change that will have an impact on the lives of others. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.